Um, so the next um, 45 minutes or so is for the COVID-19. Tobias, over to you and thank you. Thank you, Gerald, and thank you, Alexander, for the introduction. So hello to everyone. My name is Tobias Kindripa. Um, I'm the Global Lead on Mining and Metals within WWF, uh, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. We are the biggest uh, environmental and conservation NGO in the world, and we obviously work on issues uh, regarding supply chains with metals and other uh, commodities and impacts in areas of uh, over 100 countries where we're based in. And I'm really, really happy and looking forward to our conversation and session today about COVID-19 and did responsible sourcing strategies protect the most vulnerable in mineral supply chain. And I think we have an, uh, you know, a team of expertise here, which is which is unique, and I'm really glad that they all can make it. So it'd be great if the three, uh, which I will now introduce, be putting on the video as well, so everybody can see who they are. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm happy to introduce to you uh, Andrew Van uh, Sill, who is the director and principal uh, consultant at SRK Consultant consulting in, in, in South Africa. He has spent several years as technical advisor to government committees and overseeing the negotiation of mining conventions. Uh, and he's also a fellow uh, of the Southern African Institute of Mining and uh, Metallurgy. Second um, guest today and panelist is uh, Olivia Lister. She's a project manager at 11 Sources, um, overseeing multinational, multi disciplinary teams for both public and private sector clients. And she's conducting gender aware, right-based, desk-based and field research in numerous contexts. Furthermore, I'm welcoming Kan uh, Matsusaki. He's the director on ICT, electrical and electronics, shipbuilding and shipbreaking at Industrial, the global union. Uh, he was responsible for coordinating and initiating industrial policies at the Japan Council of Metal Workers Unions. And he's now promoting sustainable industrial policies and leading organi organizing projects in industrial. So uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm looking really forward to our conversation and, and to our panel discussion today. Um, with no further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor now to the first presenter, which was really kind of a keynote, and then we're going to have a discussion by Andrew. Um, so the stage is yours, Andrew, and uh, looking forward to that. Thank you very much, Tobias. <clears throat> I'm just uh, expecting the presentation to come up. Thank you. Um, you can actually move straight to slide 10. Uh, we can skip the introduction uh, for the sake of time. We can meet the team another time. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to just give a very brief introduction to some of the impact on large scale mining. That's what the LSM stands for. Um, and uh, the, the dominoes are really just uh, the, the the, the next few slides, the title of the next few slides. So if you can move, move on to the background on the next slide. So something that perhaps many of us are not familiar with, the mining industry actually has extensive experience with infectious diseases, respiratory illnesses, with community engagement, um, with wrestling around issues of confidentiality, um, have some experience with public health, health economics, drug trials, uh, epidemiology, um, and, and more so in, in some contexts than others. In South Africa, we have a long history with HIV, AIDS, and also with tuberculosis and silicosis. Um, so there've been a number of invent interventions over time to try and understand uh, what the risk factors are and to reduce uh, the risks of transmission and to reduce the prevalence um, uh, in the industry. Um, a simple example would be the installation of, uh, of ventilation, um, and also ultraviolet lights in waiting areas in clinics to try and prevent the transmission of tuberculosis. And obviously these kinds of things are, are quite pertinent and quite relevant now with uh, COVID-19, which, um, which has some shared aspects. Um, and then <clears throat> also all, all of these things uh, obviously bring a substantial amount of misinformation, um, but the industry also has some experience with, uh, with dealing with stigma, with dealing with misinformation. And, and with trying to do this in the context of, of, of health um, and employee health. Uh, so I think we can move on to the next slide. So mining was classified um, in various settings as, as uh, some combination of essential and non-essential services. Um, uh, somewhat ironically, I suppose in this context, coal mining for power station uh, use was considered essential. Um, then uh, some refineries uh, can't easily be shut down, so they needed to continue sometimes with stockpiles or other sources of material. 
Um, and then because of the mining, uh, and then also obviously we have very big differences between underground and open cast mining. Uh, the concentration of people and the amount of space between people is much larger in an open cast mining setting than it is in an underground setting where you essentially funnel people you know, through a, a, a cage or, or through a, a fairly small space uh, into a working place, which is then again distributed. Um, so the challenges with opening uh, the two different uh, kinds of mining are different. Um, and so there were, in, certainly in a South African setting, there were different approaches taken um, depending on the level of lockdown and, and the, and, and the uh, prevalence of uh, COVID in the workplace. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. Um, just a, I mean, a quick background on, on economics. Uh, price forecasting in mining is something that uh, we're inherently uh, quite bad at, um, and we've, we've struggled over time. It's very strongly linked to elasticity of supply. Um, as you can imagine, uh, supply from various countries has been disrupted at, at different times. Um, different sources of copper, for example, have, have shut down at, at different times um, and different destinations and customers have also been shut down. So this has made short term prices quite volatile. Um, what has also been a, a significant impact in many developing country settings is for those developing countries where their costs are not incurred in US dollars. Um, there have also been large fluctuations in exchange rates. Um, and uh, certainly the South African Rand has, has uh, weakened considerably and then strengthened again somewhat. Um, and this, uh, and, and since much, many of our costs are incurred in local currency and our revenue is, is received in foreign currency, uh, this also makes your, uh, your actual earnings quite unpredictable. Um, and then what's also, I guess, complicated is, is that not just have there been official sort of regulatory re uh, or government imposed lockdowns, but we've also had times where companies have voluntarily locked down to deal with, a, with an outbreak on site and, and try and get to grips with uh, sudden changes in prevalence. Um, and, and importantly, I think also it, it was quite unpredictable as to, as to what the, the um, progression of the disease would be uh, within workforces. It was also not quite clear whether mining would be a, a source of infection or merely a place where infections that were picked up in the community were actually noted and, and recorded. Um, so there were a number of places where there was a lot of uncertainty uh, around how to plan for, the, for, the, for these past six months. And, and even some uncertainty, uh, I think, that will be ongoing um, for the next few months. Um, what's happened a little bit on costs, um, there have been disruptions to supply chains. You know, there were, one of the concerns in mining was the availability of, of tires. Um, there, there are not many places where tires are manufactured for open cast mining equipment. Um, and there was a concern that if one of those factories closed down, there would be a significant shortage of tires. So, even if we were able to operate, we, we may have difficulty obtaining um, you know, basic uh, components or, or basic consumables. Um, and then again, you, you're uncertain around uh, what the cost of those will be also because of exchange rate fluctuations, but also because of changes in, in supply and demand in the supply chain itself. Um, and then furthermore, there was obviously a, a, an, an effect on uh, you know, a number of um, ports were closed, uh, a number of, of points of entry into different countries have been closed at different times. Um, so it's not clear whether, if you're in Zambia, for example, when you will be able to move copper through South Africa again or through South African ports. Um, and again, it's not clear when you'll be able to bring things into a, a, a country to replace consumables and, and, and other things that are used. So this has created a lot of uncertainty and, and, and certainly it's, it's disrupted supply chains, it's changed cost profiles, and it's led to um, uh, disruptions in payments to suppliers, which I think is important in this setting. Um, so companies have found it difficult sometimes to uh, source items that would normally be available locally and now aren't, um, because obviously all of the issues that the mining company is dealing with is, are also being dealt with by some of their local suppliers that they've relied on and that they've tried to build up as, as sources of equipment, um, uh, labor, skill, um, and, and, and other um, maintenance uh, uh, functions. So all of these things have, have created a, quite a bit of churn and, qu and quite a bit of uncertainty and, and, and have affected people's livelihoods. Um, I think you can move on to the next slide. So responses, naturally, there's been a, <clears throat> a focus on production to try and uh, uh, store or shore up revenue. Um, uh, a number of companies are obviously very concerned that the cash flow would be affected, that the debt covenants wouldn't be met. Um, so there's been a strong focus on, on production critical activities to try and generate whatever revenue is, is, can be generated with the staff that are allowed to, to come into work. 
Um, there's been some mitigation actions taken where stockpiles that, uh, that were available on surface have been processed in lieu of, uh, or to, to offset lower production from underground. Um, and then in some of the community interventions, there's there have been investments in testing capacity. Um, some companies have actually made field hospitals available. Some companies have made their own internal experts available uh, with infectious disease experience. Um, and then there's been an, uh, a focus by certainly by some of the companies on providing food and water for those who, uh, who are unemployed. Uh, the Minerals Council and, and some other statutory bodies in, in countries have, have sort of helped the mining sector coordinate a plan that they've submitted to government. Um, and, and, and in South Africa, this, uh, the mining sector plan was one of the first that was implemented and, and formed the basis for many of the other sectors going back to work. Um, <clears throat> and then just, uh, you know, a, a quick uh, so, sort of uh, uh, aside, but what, what op often happens in, in large companies and, and also in government, in, in any sort of bureau bureaucracy, what you can find is that uh, people's default position is, is to do nothing rather than to risk making a mistake. Um, you know, very few people in a large uh, organization, whether it's in the public or private sector, ever got fired for, for doing nothing. Um, but, uh, but you, you, you know, making a mistake can, can really be career limiting. Um, so, so and it's not mentioned, not meant as a criticism. It's just a natural, uh, uh, you know, that's just, that's just how the, those, those settings work. So what does tend to happen as soon as there's a large amount of uncertainty, a, a lot of things just don't happen. And, and even though there are good intentions on the part of, of senior managers, um, it becomes very difficult to define all of the possible ways in which something is or isn't acceptable when it's not within very, um, when it's, it's sort of an atypical situation. So, so there've, there've certainly been impacts, um, some of them unintentional, uh, you know, um, and, and some of them just a, a difficulty of, of turning a large ship uh, quickly to respond to something unexpected. Um, okay, the next slide. <clears throat> um, as for the future, I, I think we're likely to see more remote working. Um, this is, uh, has a number of, of potential implications. There are certainly places where senior staff and office staff are, uh, are, are working remotely. Um, but I think that this technology will also facilitate lower level staff uh, working remotely and, and, and facilitate the pr productivity um, and changing who can work in different settings. <clears throat> Finally, there's definitely been a, a, a large impact on suppliers and employees, <clears throat> even with the best will and, and with companies trying to make plans, <clears throat> people have gone out of business and have lost contracts um, and some, some mines will struggle to get back off care and maintenance. Um, and then, it, yes, it has been a setback to social and labor plans, and, and many of them didn't foresee a, a pandemic like this. Uh, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for that. Um, I have a short recap on question, which I'm interested in. You, you said quite often the word uncertainty, which obviously is the case for as well as policy as for companies. But I'm interested in to see how large scale companies and how large scale mining companies actually worked in their approaches with uncertainty in various countries, right? I mean, they have different kind of sites in other countries where different kind of policy work. So in your terms of experience and that, how did they deal with and were there approaches which actually been more effective than other ones? Um, <clears throat> I think it's quite difficult to say now whether, whether something worked. I, I think we, um, I mean, what, what, what I have, uh, had the opportunity to to see is, is companies discussing what they tried to do. Um, I think what's difficult, and we have discussed a little bit in the team, where certainly some of what they've tried to do hasn't worked um, in some settings. In, in other places, it's been more effective. You know, so they've tried to improve payment terms. They've tried to bring payments forward. There have been a number of, of, of interventions that, that, that the more responsible companies have certainly tried to, to put in place. You know, many of them have spent many years developing supplier networks, trying to build SMME capacity, trying to build uh, local capacity to, to source goods locally and services locally. Um, but many activities did just stop. So, so even where payment terms were brought forward, some things didn't happen that people would have been relying on. Um, and and so, so it, it's difficult, I think, now to say, certainly there, there are reports of, of, com of smaller companies that have really struggled. Um, that, that, that there's been a, a big impact. I think the other thing, <clears throat> you know, just looking at, at some of our other clients as well, where 
you know, an awful lot of headspace has gone into trying to manage and mitigate um, what, what's happening on in an operational sense. So, so there's a lot of strategic work then that, that has to get put, put aside. Um, there, there's potentially a lot of uh, the planning cycle comes to, a, come, comes to a, a sort of goes on pause while people try and just understand, well, how, how do they produce with only half their staff underground? How, how do they send them down in, in 10 batches instead of two? Uh, you know, so there's, there's an awful lot that, 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 uh, get, that distracts uh, operational management um, in a time like this, and 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 so yes, undoubtedly, other things will will sort of fall through the cracks while people try and work out how to safely operate and and also understand their liabilities towards staff. All right, thanks, Andrew, for that. I didn't expect the whole answer to 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 be complete, and that it was just really interested in that. I think the whole uh, everybody who is joining that call as well. Uh, and thanks, Andrew, for giving us an input on the large scale mining part. And I'm happy now to go over to Olivia uh, because you know besides besides large scale mining, obviously in our project artisanal and small scale mining is a big issue, and Levin Sources are working on that for years and years. So my question on Olivia would be kind of given kind of an introduction, but kind of a sense on what actually happened in the artisanal and small scale mining. Uh, community, um, perhaps even on commodities, uh, which are focusing on such as gold, and what your, um, you know, kind of kind of view on that is how, you know, it was um, being offered approaches by companies in the supply chain, for example, or policy actors such as the OECD on, you know, communities um, in, in, in certain areas. Hi, thanks, um, Tobias, that's great. Um, I'll probably start with a sort of brief explanation of artisanal mining, um, we call it ASM, artisanal and small scale mining, for those who aren't familiar um, with it on the call. Um, it is essentially a, a very simplified form of mineral production of exploration and processing. Um, and it generally has very um, low capital intensity, but very high labor intensity. So um, there are estimates that say about 83% of the world's mining workforce are artisanal and small scale miners. Um, again, it's, it's very difficult to quantify because the sector is highly informal, um, but estimates um, are that there are about 40 million artisanal miners throughout the world. Um, and then dependent on the artisanal mining sector, so that's miners' households um, and people providing services to the sector, they think there's about 150 million uh, around the world. So it's, it's a lot of people that we are talking about. Um, and in terms of the impacts of COVID on the artisanal mining sector, um, in some ways they've been quite, there are some similarities with what Andrew was talking about. Um, for example, in the large scale mining sector, um, in terms of supply chain disruption, one of the things that we've seen um, the most was the inability of minerals to move along supply chains. And that's had some important negative impacts on the artisanal mining sector. Um, because, for example, um, artisanal gold miners um, weren't, it, there are trends that artisanal gold miners weren't able to sell their production um, to buyers, and buyers weren't able to move um, gold through countries and then internationally. Um, and because artisanal miners tend to live hand to mouth, um, they don't have the, um, the capital to, or the finance to stockpile gold. And so what we saw was huge decreases in production um, and big drops in income for individual miners on the ground. Um, and then as a result of that, we saw increases in food insecurity. Um, we saw uh, different impacts on different groups of artisanal miners. Um, because it's a bit of an umbrella term for, for very different types of mineral production. Um, and so there are very, there are informal artisanal miners who work um, in a much more sort of simplistic fashion. And then there are more towards the small scale side where um, people work with mechanization, with earth moving um, equipment. Um, and so in different countries and for different groups of miners, we saw different impacts. Um, in terms of some of the more specific impacts that we saw, um, and, um, and Tobias, you asked about some of the approaches that um, governments and um, or the sort of regulatory environment, uh, we saw that in most cases, artisanal mining was seen as an essential um, activity 
because of the income that it generates for so many people and the fact that it's a poverty driven activity. Um, however, there were some limitations to that. So um, we did a study, for example, looking at the impacts of COVID in Zimbabwe and Uganda, Mozambique and the DRC. Um, and we saw that um, in Zimbabwe, only registered artisanal miners uh, were technically allowed to continue mining, but that's only 83% of the artisanal miners in the country, which meant that then a huge proportion were not theoretically allowed to continue mining under the restrictions um, and so face challenges in, in income earning. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a sort of overview of the impacts of COVID on artisanal mining for now, please. All right, thanks, Olivia. I mean, it's it's crazy though, right? If I if I understand you right, and I'm I'm aware of that as well, but I think nobody, not that everybody's aware of that. So there's an asymmetry, right? So on the one hand, there's the price of gold is rising. On the other hand, actually the the income of people who actually mine it is decreasing, right? So there's a big gap in between that. So I'd be interested in in obviously this is for gold an issue that might be totally different with mm -hmm. tungsten, that might be totally different with tin uh, and tantal. So is that related as well in terms of awareness and in terms of sector who's actually you know getting these kind of materials from? Would you say there was an, a difference in approaches by sectors for different kind of commodities, uh, which were mined artisanal? Definitely, yeah. So as you mentioned for the gold sector, you know, we've seen very, very high international gold prices over the last few months, even reaching you know, above $2,000 an ounce. And that has not translated to um, prices on the ground at artisanal mines. Um, the Artisanal Gold Council did a very interesting um, data collection on prices at artisanal mine sites. And at the height of the pandemic in sort of April, May time, um, there were some places where artisanal miners were seeing um, a, a discount uh, of up to 40% in some case, in Burkina Faso, for example, I think the highest was 43% less. Uh, they were being paid 43% less for the gold that they were selling, despite the fact that international prices were so high. Um, and so I think that's one of the main lessons that we've learned is that, that the impacts have been very specific to different minerals. Um, and so therefore responses have to be very specific. If we look um, on the other side of the scale at, at construction minerals, for example, the impacts were different there because the demand tends to be domestic. So in, um, in Uganda, the construction uh, sector essentially ground to a halt due to the lockdown restrictions which meant that artisanal uh, producers of stone aggregate had no market to sell to. Um, in some cases, in Mozambique, for example, the restrictions were much less intense for the construction mineral sector. And so uh, the artisanal miners didn't have such a problem. Um, and in the Mozambique gold sector as well, because the government domestic travel restrictions were less, buyers could still travel to the mine sites which meant that the miners uh, didn't have such a problem selling their gold, which they had done in other countries. Um, yeah, so as you said, the hugely differential impact by mineral. And one of the biggest lessons I think that we can learn is that um, all of our responses have to be very specific to the context that we're looking at. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Olivia. Um, everybody who wants to ask questions, by the way, please put them in the Q&A. So because we have a question in Q&A in the end, so we can wrap up with, it, with these. Um, now, you know, we touch base of a lot of issues on workforces, whether it's from small scale or large scale mining. And we have an expert here, you actually can talk about that by um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a kind of view, what it actually meant um, from industrial point of view, um, from a global union point of view. And I'm happy to um, uh, put Khan in the discussion. So my question to Khan um, would be, in terms of, you know, there are different kind of approaches been taken by different countries. There are different commodities, obviously. There are different kind of mining issues. And then overall, what is kind of your perspective on the impacts of COVID-19 for the people working actually in the mines, whether it's large scale, small scale, whether it's copper, whether it's gold, kind of given us this, you know, kind of an overview in the beginning to understand what kind of impact it has. Thanks, Khan. Okay, thank you, Tobias. Uh, first of all, uh, for, for those of you who don't know about the Industrial Global Union, I would like to introduce a little bit about our organization. Uh, we are representing workers uh, from mining, energy, and manufacturing industry. And we have now uh, 50 million uh, members uh, from 600 uh, different affiliate unions in 140 
uh, countries. So we are actually represented workers throughout the supply chain of this uh, you know, responsible mining. Um, of course, this you know, COVID-19 has very much impacted on our jobs uh, and or on our health and safety. But uh, you know, the most important things is that uh, you know, how the workers can fully exercise uh, the occupational health and safety rights at the workplaces, including preventing uh, this COVID-19 pandemic in the workplaces. So uh, as you may all know that you know, there's a three important right for the workers, which is right to know about hazard at workplaces and right to refuse uh, or to shut down unsafe work and also like to participate fully in the health and safety decision making. And this three right is actually heavily related to uh, other trade union rights, which is freedom of association, and also the right to collective bargaining and right to strike. And there, there's, uh, you know, um, the very severe figure actually uh, revealed by uh, International Trade Union Confederation and uh, when, when you see this ITUC's website, you will know this, uh, you know, 2020 Global Right Index. And it says that, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic actually even accelerate uh, the violation uh, of those rights. And, um, you know, the 74% of the country of, in the world actually violated uh, the right to create the union or right to join the union. And 80% of the country is actually violated the light of collective bargaining and 85% of country actually violated right to strike. So, and this, uh, you know, violation is we actually are mainly seen in Latin America, Africa and South Asia, where many mining site is located. And um, so this is our, uh, you know, the, the challenge actually. Um, we actually have a lot of cases uh, in those regions and those countries who actually uh, the, the, the occupational health and safety right and right to uh, the trade union right is not secured. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the employers often uh, forced workers to go to workplaces, even uh, the state of government, uh, you know, the, pro uh, the uh, suggest to the company to shut down the workplaces during the pandemic COVID-19. And uh, we see many cases that you know now uh, many employers actually using uh, this COVID-19 as excuse to reduce wages or dismiss the workers. So uh, the, our challenge is right now, uh, you know, this COVID-19 is accelerating by violation of the workers' rights and occupational health and safety rights, including mining site and also how we can secure uh, our employment in the future. So this is actually uh, our biggest challenge right now. So uh, what we're doing is right now is in terms of occupational health and safety, uh, we are providing uh, the guideline uh, for the workers and employers. So if you see our website, if you Google uh, industrial COVID-19, then you will easily find our special website regarding on COVID-19. And we actually uh, make this guidance uh, advice for the workers and employers how if you really need to still operate uh, or uh, if we want to continue uh, the operation uh, in the mining site or the factories, uh, you know, uh, this guidance uh, will be very much uh, valuable uh, for the workers and employer to pro protect the you know, workers and health and safety and also we actually advise to the employer uh, or the government that we need to have a proper social dialogue. Uh, even if this is not COVID-19, uh, in many countries still there's no, uh, you know, the proper social dialogue between employer, government and trade union. Um, this is very much important how, because, you know, uh, we have quite many tools uh, on the ground uh, you know, we have a truce from OECD, we have many conventions from ILO, and there's many initiatives on the responsible mining. But the question is, who will implement those kind of convention, health and safety standard, and social dialogue system? And this is actually, uh, you know, if you cannot achieve this uh, you know, social dialogue between uh, the proper social dialogue, then we, cannot, we can never implement those kind of standards. 
uh, auto convention. So uh, we in the strawberry union is always, uh, you know, of course, uh, organizing is our job, the first job, but uh, uh, we would uh, try to, uh, you know, stimulate, uh, you know, the major company or the major government uh, to secure this, uh, you know, workers' rights and to achieve decent work for all throughout supply chain. Uh, for example, now uh, we are focusing on the battery supply chain. This is uh, you know, very much use, uh, you know, focusing on from the mining side, uh, the electronics industry, and also um, you know, the battery demand will increase in the future in the automobile industry, especially for uh, electric vehicles. So we are trying to map out uh, you know, who is the main players, who is the main initiative, uh, who is the main government, and try to influence from the union side to uh, to secure this, uh, you know, uh, the workers' rights even uh, in this COVID nineteen situation. So this is, uh, you know, just my introduction, uh, introductory, uh, you know, comment from, uh, you know, for now. Thank you. Thank you, Khan. That was super exciting and super interesting. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have a Q and A now, so a lot of people who are interested in the topic can obviously ask questions. We have some of the questions already put in. Um, a question which is uh, regarded to um, Andrew was more about how many actually people working in large scale mining. Perhaps on that uh, there are various numbers, and Olivia already talked about 83% coming from small scale mining, so about 10 to 20% working in large scale, which would be up to 8 million people, if I'm right. Uh, if you have a comment on that, uh, Andrew, please go please go on. Um, otherwise, um, I would love to hear actually more also, you know, in terms of how we can um, learn from this kind of experience. Uh, Andrew was saying there were, you know, obviously a lot of uncertainty before, before COVID-19 in that kind of sense. There were different kind of diseases coming up, such as HIV and other issues uh, on health parts. Uh, there's the mercury contamination by artisanal and small scale mining. So this kind of pandemic and events happen. So my question still is to understand that better in your point of view uh, from Kanz, from Olivia's and from from Andrews, um, you know, there are a lot of approaches that have been taken and there are a lot of stakeholders involved in that. What if you can change something? What would be the biggest gap and where needs to be put more awareness into that, right? So where is something which you would put in uh, your money and your capacity if you could? Um, and I'd love to start with uh, Olivia, if you can kindly give me kind of an, you know, one part uh, where we should need to look into, if that's possible. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, I was about to say that's a very difficult question, to be honest, because there are there are so many places where we need to be investing. Um, I think, in terms of the uh, ASM sector, um, especially now during the pandemic, um, one of the the best ways of supporting the you know 840 million people that work in ASM um, is by um, positively engaging with them. Um, so we've seen throughout the pandemic several calls to action um, not to disengage with artisanal mining um, along supply chains. And so we've seen that in the jewelry sector. Um, we've seen it more broadly in terms of due diligence that OECD released a call to action, encouraging people not to, to, to prioritize good due diligence during this time. Um, and there's been a, a recent one signed by about 20 organizations, um, again, um, talking about the uh, a major jeweler has just announced that they're going to source only recycled gold. Um, so encouraging people that while it's important to source recycled gold, it's also important to source directly from ASM because that is the one primary way in which the sector will be able to develop and in which lots of the risks involved in the sector like human rights risks, like labor risks and health and safety, um, environmental impacts, like Tobias mentioned, mercury pollution, that kind of thing. Those things can, can only be um, slowly uh, solved, I suppose, with engagement with the sector. So if there was one thing that I think um, we needed to do more of, it's probably that. And we've already, there have already been a lot of um, movement in that direction. So the Artisanal Gold Council um, has um, a sort of health in, gold out approach to the COVID pandemic, um, using existing infrastructure to make sure that we're still, they're still buying artisanal gold. And then um, through the same infrastructure, feeding um, health assistance and health information. Um, lots of responsible sourcing initiatives um, have done similar things. There's the, um, I forgot what it's called, the Gemstone, um, Gemstone Supply Chain Action Scheme, which is a platform of people um, collaborating, gem professionals and jewelers looking at um, 
at buying artisanally produced gemstones at the moment. Um, and so there's already a lot being done in that area, but I would say that's probably the place where, where we need to do more and to really understand each context. So that can only be done with relationships on the ground with artisanal producers. It can only be done in collaboration with other um, responsible sourcing uh, professionals and um, yeah. Perfect, thanks. Um, there is another question by Ben on you, but we will jump on that later because I would like to, uh, and you can read that perhaps through in the beginning and then we'll uh, have this question uh, asked as well. But I wanna go over to Andrew for now um, because there were a lot of things, uh, actually Olivia touched base and Khan already, which I think would be really interesting for the large scale mining industry in general as well. The whole question about implementation, right? And in terms of uh, policies, which is a big, a big case for companies, obviously. So it's not only about guidance and things you have in place, but how to get it implemented as well. If you are yeah. you know working in a country which for, for example is not good governed um so this is a big issue so my question on that would be as well uh, if that is the big case in COVID 19 which you have seen in terms of policy and in terms of guidance which can't be implemented if that's there's a gap for example um for for, for the companies where do you think and how do you think uh, these kind of large-scale mining companies can actually engage more in terms of policy levels and and help to implement these kind of issues and be kind of a front runner because a lot of these companies are actually front running for good governance aspects in several countries so i'd be really interested in, in how there was a shift between policy and implementation uh, pushing from large-scale mining companies whether you've seen that on, in, in this case yeah so <clears throat> sure i mean these are some uh, some uh, challenging questions um so, so, so I think that that companies have have become much better at um, uh, at, at understanding the, the the value of uh, of some of these policies, and 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 many of uh, you know many of the bigger miners really are comfortable with with trying to be responsible um, corporate citizens, um, and and they have made uh, made progress. And and if I listen to some of the the language that's used, some of the concern. Um, uh, around how uh, discussions are framed and, and the, the relationships with stakeholders, there, there's certainly been a shift, um, and and there is a, an appreciation of the of involvement in policy, and there's an appreciation that that some policies also provide protection. Um, so when there's a, a minimum acceptable standard, it, it does become that much easier to actually implement the kinds of uh, safeguards that 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 many places would like to operate with. Um, it, it, it is that much nicer to work in a place where your employees are safe and well. Um, so, so, you know, having that required and, and having uh, the bulk of the, the sort of cost curve required to operate responsibly, um, whether it's through things like equator principles or, or EU policies or, 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 you know, like what we're doing here. Uh, I mean, those kinds of things do provide, do make it easier for companies to actually work responsibly. Um, and, and I think there has been a, an understanding that engagement on policy is required. I mean, there is an interesting um, dynamic as well, and, and I'm, I'm sort of on the fly here, so I haven't, uh, you know, I'm, I hope this comes out correctly, but, but there is also a certain amount of, um, you, you know, something gets uh, initiated, it gets discussed, but then it gets implemented, and then often it gets challenged in a, in a legal setting. Um, so we'll see uh, unions take companies to court and say, well, you know, what you've done doesn't make us safe enough. And, and, and then there's a process whereby we sort of come to understand what does the policy mean, what does the regulation mean. So I think there's also an interaction between um, the commercial sector and, and the uh, and, and, and the legal sector, and, and a requirement that courts sort of engage with these things reasonably timelessly, um, um, so that we can understand when we bring in a new regulation. You know, there's a requirement that it goes through a legal process, and we establish exactly what it means. Um, and, and this sort of puts everybody in a position where they're a little bit more comfortable. Um, that, that, that they do know that, that, you know, that this is acceptable. And certainly for something like this, I mean, Ken, I think we referred to it, but, you know, we place our employees at risk and, and what's reasonable and, and what's okay and, and what is too much risk and, and, and uh, what is a, a reasonable burden of care. And, and so those are things that are quite difficult um, to create certainty around. Um, and, and yes, it is an interactive process between policymakers, between companies and, and the courts. 
Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, that was uh, that was really interesting. And so, I mean, obviously, civil society is, is 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 part of that as well in science. So I'm really interested in how that all puts together, especially in our, our project we are facing, uh, because there are a lot of details we have to come together, and this is always complicated in in issues like that. So um, the question now to 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 Khan, and we only have five minutes left, so I'll be sharp um, as well on my questions. But Khan, the question by Alejandro, which is a great one, I think, because it was my last question to you actually as well, uh, to give me a compliment as well. Is um, so if you European companies, uh, you know, need to improve their sourcing practice. Um, what, in terms of, of, of workforce and in terms of human rights issue, what would be the first and the minimum to do? What would be the part to start with, um, especially for medium and the small size company? This is always a question uh, which pops up uh, in terms of cost and so on. So thanks, Khan, if you can touch base on that. Well, thank you very much for that question. Uh, because that the point is how we can ask, uh, you know, uh, demand multinational company to, uh, to, to actually, uh, you know, follow the international rule, not the rule uh, of the national uh, in the local lo local nation. Because you know, that sometimes it is very strange that the multinational companies behave behave well uh, in the Europe or the Japan, the developed country. But when they operate in the developing country like Latin America, Africa, and South Africa. They be, they be, behave differently, so which has uh, you know they are actually operating in the double standard. So first thing uh, we need to think about is how we can uh, pressurize multinational company to uh, to follow fully follow the international standards, which is a minimum standard for the all uh, business and all for the all workers. Um, so this is this applies to, you know this Europe. Uh, there's many uh, the European uh, the standards and which follows international standards. So uh, I think uh, you know throughout this uh, in the project, I think uh, you know we also need to target uh, what is the uh, the minimum international standard that multinational companies have to take, and what is the uh, uh, the bad example uh, in the national law. Uh, in the developing countries that we need to uh, you know, avoid. So this is kind of uh, you know, uh, the question that we are had because uh, uh, we cannot fully rely on the government, especially in the developing countries. You know, still uh, many government actually doesn't, don't even ratify this uh, international standard you know, convention. For example, uh, she, uh, ILO, uh, the convention 176, which is the mining of special health and safety, uh, only the government, three, 33 government only ratified this convention out of, uh, you know, 180 governments. So, uh, so we actually need to find a way to how we can, uh, you know, uh, pressurize uh, multinational companies uh, who are operating in the, you know, uh, the, the, the countries, uh, you know, uh, in the developing countries. Thank you, Khan, for that. Um, and we only have three minutes left, so I'll, I'll be even more sharper now. Uh, Olivia, if you can shortly answer the question um, by Ben, and I know this is a big one as well, Ben, <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, whether, uh, you know, Levin Sources or Olivia have kind of an, an idea about uh, develop or innovating and developing more sustainable models for due diligence projects on the ground. Perhaps if you can shortly uh, touch base on that and then have a last final question for Andrew. Um, yes, this, I mean, this is the million dollar question, um, <laughs> but I'll just try and sort of quickly throw some ideas out there. I think, um, I think now is potentially a window of opportunity. The supply chain disruptions have been very um, challenging for the artisanal mining sector, um, but I think that it could be um, a window of opportunity for responsible sourcing, people who are interested in responsible sourcing to um, engage directly with ASMs, given that um, market access is very difficult. Um, so, so now is the time, I suppose. Um, I think that we there could be innovations in terms of financing. You mentioned financial pressure is one of the big challenges. Um, what can we do in terms of responsible investment um, and the creation of funds that ASMs and responsible sourcing, um, people interested in responsible sourcing can tap into um, in terms of um, yes, yeah, so a, a more a sort of high level investment space. Um, I think that collaboration is key. So can we create communities of practice of refiners, for example, or investors or insurers? We have a, a we're part of a project um, in the DRC, responsible sourcing project in the DRC at the moment called uh, Zahabul Safi CBCFG. Um, and one of the biggest challenges that we find of people sourcing from ASM and the DRC is, is getting that process insured. Um, so 
there are lots of different avenues we can go down. Sorry, because we are stuck now. You don't have to be sorry. It's super interesting. But yeah, in terms of timing, and uh, you know, I don't want to get uh, get the problems with Gerald. Um, but one last question I have for Andrew because I already asked it Olivia and I already asked that Khan. So it'd be great, Andrew, just uh, if you can can kind of get the idea of the approaches. I, I said before in the beginning we don't want to have a final approach. What didn't work? What didn't work? It's it's a long story. There's so many indicators of it. But in terms of let's say South Africa and and the work they did in large scale mining and the COVID crisis, what do you think? Where approach with actually was quite well received and it did work in depending on the impact you're looking to i know that but i'm just generally speaking and something which you think is something that has to be approved or there's something which there's a gap and there's no no meaning at all at the moment in that kind of sense for at least the needs of large scale mining companies yeah, so i mean i think it is very difficult when you have a complete disruption um i think that is difficult to uh to, to sort of uh you know more um uh, I guess kind of steady state challenges. You know, we had a, a, an ongoing burden of TB that that we could learn to 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 deal with. And but this sort of sudden large scale disruption is is actually very difficult to predict and and, and to to plan around. I mean, I think I, I think you'd I would hope to see that there would be a little bit less leverage and a little bit less um, just in time and uh, you know maybe some of the moves towards uh, destocking as much as possible and. And running as lean as possible maybe we see some of the limits of that um and and, and some of it is as i say i mean around creating a little bit of certainty and predictability um and and, and maybe a, a bigger ability to absorb shocks um and and so hopefully that'll be some of the lessons coming out of here um, ways of, of of you know maybe being slightly less leveraged but maybe also being a little bit more flexible in um in, in how we uh, we manage internally and outwards um, I think Olivia's comment around collaboration, I, th I think that's something that you know, the mining industry, I think, is in a transition from being quite insular and relying on uh, on, on contracts and, and formal policies and regulations and license and tenure um, to becoming more collaborative. And I, I'm hoping it's something that will accelerate over time, where uh, there's, there's sort of an ongoing integration and, and, and we see more shared resources. And, and, and although the process to get to that place is, is a more inefficient process, but there's a there's a lot of security and and a lot of um, I guess it's a commend it's a it's a it's a better and more commendable approach to actually um, help build shared resources um, for which license is actually more stable um, and and which benefit more people um, rather than relying on on contracts and and hoping that because a rule says somebody can't take something that you know that's where your safety lies I, th I think it's happening but I think it will hopefully accelerate from here. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Khan, for your um, for the great inputs you had and the great discussion. Sorry for my really, really long uh, questions, which probably can't be answered in like 25 minutes, but you did really well. And and hope everybody stays in touch and we will get back to some of the questions which we already asked in the chat room. And now it's over back to uh, Gerald, I think. Uh, and um, thanks for that.